the inspiration for this talk is Joe told me last week that trying for him trying to understand lately articles or things related to that it's very very helpful to be able to work out all the nuts and bolts and details for SL2 and then once you have that you have some confidence that you can do the other things. So we saw last week that um, SL2 appeared uh, in connection with P1. Okay, so today we're going to take that inspiration and try to work out some of the details for P1 with the idea that if you have confidence that you can compute anything you want with P1, then when a new concept comes, you can compute it all in that example, and then it's not too hard to sort of see what happens when you generalize. Okay. Now, there were two sets of course notes that I used when I was preparing for this, and they're both self-contained and uh, very, very highly recommended, very easy to read. Um, one is by Christian Snell, who's a professor at Stony Brook, um, and one is by Mitch Mustada, uh, a professor at Michigan. They're both courses on D modules, but they're very different in style. So, so this course, the style is to basically take sort of uh, the most concrete case, and the first nine lectures are devoted to developing the theory in that special case. So this is the, the case of the biological algebra. And then after that, he cycles back and then goes through everything a second time in more generality. Okay. Whereas the approach in this course is the more Grotian deep style approach of you just start with the perfect answer and you do everything perfectly and every step seems extremely easy. Uh, but at the end of it, you've sort of solved everything without realizing it. And a really good reference for algebraic geometry, there's not much background of, at all assumed in these actually, but a very good background for algebraic geometry is these notes by Ravi McKeel called the Rising Sea, uh, Foundations of Algebraic Geometry. And this is based on um, an analogy of Grotendi, who said that if you, if you have the perfect abstract framework, then it's like you have an ocean and you have an island and you just slowly pump CO2 into the atmosphere and without doing any work, the average global sea temperature will, will the average temperatures will rise and the sea will go up and the island will go underneath and at no point you feel like you're doing anything. It's just all like magic. So there's another quote in this book and it's something to do with the matrix and a red a red pill and a green blue pill. And it's something to do with when you're starting these notes, if you should take the red pill or the blue pill. Blue pill, but I ran out of time preparing the talk. And I haven't watched the Matrix for a while. <laughs> There's some sort of analogy there, and we have to decide which route we're gonna take. And there isn't like a right or a wrong answer, but for most people who, in the same way that most people's last name is a grocery league, most people when they're doing research in mathematics or learning things, it's like they're stumbling around in the dark looking for a light switch. And it's only once they've found the light switch when they look back and, and sort of then later can look for like the perfect solution, okay, rather than just being presented the perfect solution. So we're gonna go with the more nuts and bolts. Of, we're gonna take this pill, which is the nuts, more nuts and bolts approach. Okay, so I wanna start by kind of reviewing last week in slightly more generality than last week. So I'm just going to take a field to be C the whole time, but you could just take the important thing here is that it's characteristic zero and the the vial algebra. So we saw this last week in the case of one variable. So this is the uh, you use it over. Oh. Uh, so. so this is the algebra generated by X one blue line C N modular relation the relations for uh, the X I S community. And the delta of the buffer derivatives. Yeah. And we have one more relation. Okay. 
Well, this is one if i is equal to square and zero otherwise, and there's a little bit of a trick here for an abusive notation where you can think of this algebra in two ways. You can think of it as some abstract, something abstractly generated by the symbols modulo these relations, or it has a faithful representation. You can think of it as embedded in uh, endomorphisms of this, where the delta i's act by taking the i of the derivative. Um, and in the literature, there's just an abuse of a notation where you just call them delta i's. Uh, and it get, can be slightly confusing, but the delta i's can either be in the abstract way, or most of the time, we are thinking of them as endomorphisms. Okay. And the key fact about this algebra is that um, SLM is left Noetherian. Um, what does that mean? So let Noetherian means that any, so I'm just going to talk about left modules in this talk. The right modules is similar. So any left uh, submodule uh, of a FG for finitely generated left AN module. Is finitely generated. Okay, that's one way you can define the theory. There's equivalent ways to do it. But what does this mean? So it means that if I have M, which is a finitely generated left AN module, so what does that mean? Finitely generated means that there's some Q, there's some map. Uh, of a n left a n modules from a n point subjecting onto m. So this is the meta frequency of a n modules left a n modules. And this has some kernel, and the Noetherian, Noetherian this means the kernel, which is a submodule of something that's finitely generated, is, is finite. Is also finitely generated, so then I can subject onto this. Okay. And this guy, this is a free map between free AN modules. So we think of this as just determining a matrix, a P by Q matrix, and the entries in here, P, I, J, by elements of AN. Okay. No, no, it's yeah, it's also right. So I'm doing everything for left, but it's also right. And it's an easy way to switch between left and right modules for uh, A and modules, but we won't do that. Like if you map uh, xi to xi and delta i to minus delta i, then this relation gets multiplied by minus one. You switch anyway. But we'll do that'll probably come up next week. But yeah, for the moment for today, we're just gonna shoot entries left. Oh yeah, the global story is a little bit different on the local story. Oh. Okay, so this was our last week. This thing here was our system of differential equations. So um okay, so conversely. So I can, so what this saying is if I, I can start with a system of differential equations, which is this guy and take a co-kernel and I get a left AN module, but every left AN module comes about in this way. So, um, and we have, um, the solutions factor which takes uh, a left A module S and it takes it to home from A and from, uh, from M. 
So what does this, what's the idea here? So remember the idea was giving a map from my M into some S is equivalent to choosing a map from this guy to here, okay? But giving an AM module map from here to here is like choosing, I need to choose Q elements of S. So those are my Q solutions. And the requirement for this map from here to here to factor through M is that when I compose with here, I get zero, okay? So this, that condition are these P constraints, which are these P differential equations, which came up. So Jordy did this when N equals one, and we have one thing here, but the same thing goes through. That's why I'm doing it this part a little bit. Okay. And one thing to know for later in the course is that this solutions factor is going to be important, but it's not exact. And so we're going to take the derived version of this, and that's where derived categories are going to become involved. So can you think of this as like solutions in S? Yeah, solutions in S. That's right. Okay, and I put some exercises here just to get, I know this a little bit fast, but you just got to get the exercises will help you get familiar with these definitions. So the first example, the first exercise will be interesting for people who've done a course, some sort of undergraduate course on differential equations, because one of the standard tricks in differential equations is if you're in one variable X and you have a, you have a differential equation of order N, in this case, N equals two, there's a standard trick which says solving that is the same as changing it into a, an equivalent system of n first order differential equations. Okay. And the exercise is just to write down what does that mean in terms of a n modules when n equals two. And once you do it when n equals two, you it, it's not hard to see what happens for high n. Okay, and then there's two more two more exercises. And again, the idea of the exercise is really just, to, it's not the trick here, it's just to get you familiar with the concepts. Okay. This vial algebra and its modules is kind of the local topic, is the local story. And I want to just review a few facts from algebraic geometry, which are going to be very helpful in the course and helpful in this lecture. Um, but I think Johnny said you were asked back to the title and it took you the space function which one was looking for solution for example are they looking for a So there was a question in the chat what's S. But it, S is an AN module, a left AN module. So it depends what uh, yeah, it's just a left AN module. Something on which AN acts on the left. Right. And we want to think of it like analytic function. Yeah, you could for, for example. That's right. But Alan, then your HOM MS doesn't make sense. I have a left AN module. I have a left AN module. And okay, maybe this isn't super precise, but I can talk about left modules of left AN modules. No, but like on the left, on the left, if you want to write, write it that way, it should be left AN module M. And then, you know, solutions is HOM out of. So the solutions of the differential equation voted by M that are valued in S. So yes, it's like a coefficient. M is the guy which is a AM module. So I've got to give a map from my solutions. I need to give you a map from here to here, subject to constraints. And these are the constraints. So in the picture last week, we just had our yeah, we just have one differential equation, P. Okay. We just have this story. So I think it's just good to, um, like usually solutions functor is viewed as a functor of M and S is fixed. Oh, okay. Oh, and S is fixed, okay, all right. You know, like S is some convenient class of functions. All right, okay, cool. All right, so yeah, that's okay. That that actually doesn't come up in the book, so it was just meant to be a preview of what's going on. But I guess yeah. Okay, so a little bit about 
like I want to review a little bit of what we need to know about phase and our great geometry. So if we take X, it's going to be a variety over over K. And the way to understand, or well, one way to understand this is by looking at um, you look at open subsets in X, which have uh, so, something called an open outline. And we hear A is a finitely generated K algebra. So this is what the line is meant by. So finitely generated K algebra just means uh, it's generated by holonomial rings subject to some equations. So this guy looks like affine space cut out by some equations. Okay. And you want this, to do this or anything? Sorry. Uh, you want to oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, all my varieties are going to be smooth from what follows, but yes, uh, I want this to be reduced to make it reducible as well. Uh, we're going to switch to smooth in a second. Um, so, yeah, and this U has a basis. U, the topology, the topo we have this risky topology on U, and that has a basis. Of these special open sets. So for every F in A, I have an open set U sub F contained in U, which I can think of as the set of points in U where F is not equal to zero. But the formal way of saying this is a uh, spec of the ring I get by inverting F. Okay, so I have my big space X, I have some U. The X can be covered by U, and U can be covered by these U sub F. You think of F as some polynomial cutting out a region where it's zero, and what's left over is my U sub F. Okay. And then we also want to be able to talk about P. So my notation for the sheaf is a sheaf is going to be something which sends an open set U. If I take U contained in X open, it's going to associate some group, which I'll then I use somewhere. And I'll call this the sections on U. Okay. And these sheaves, um, these sheaves are like, Quite complicated, so you can have sheaves of rings, sheaves, sheaves of modules, and you can have homomorphisms between sheaves. So if I have two sheaves F and G, um, a homomorphism from F to G, I need to assign for every open set. For every open set U, I need a map from the sheaf of sections on F to the sheaf of sections on G, and I need this to be compatible with restrictions. And then you get uh, sort of a fancy construction which is on sheet from F to G. So this is a sheet on X and its global sections on a set U is uh, yeah. Is um forms from F restricted on the G restricted on the So the point is, as soon as you start thinking about it, this it's just like extremely confusing. Like this is saying this guy, if I take an open, what's its values on an open set? On the open set, I need to give you a map which to every open set contained in you gives me a map from sections on F to sections of G. And I need to ensure that if I have another open set contained in that open set, I have another map from sections on here to sections on here. I need to check they're compatible. And so at this point, you're thinking like, okay, I can just, this is great, but I could never compute an example unless X is a point because I've all these infinitely many sets and I've got to check this ridiculously complicated condition. Um, you know, and then somebody is going to come along to you later and say, oh, actually we can make, if these are modules, we can talk about homes of, you know, rings of modules. And then they're going to say, 
oh, but this, you know, we're going to take some derived version of this, and this is going to be a sheepy X. And at that point, you just say, okay, I'm going home. Like, this is just ridiculous. So, like, what's the way around this? Like, how do people do algebraic geometry? And this is the motivation for something called quasi coherent sheaves, where you just kind of quasi coherent sheaves, you just ignore, you can just ignore a lot of these complexities. So, um, so uh, a sheaf F is quasi coherent. Or I'll just say Q to C. Or if uh, for every open outline, for every open outline, if I let Oh, is it quasi coherent? The shape, sorry, I meant to say a shape of OX module. So, so I have one shape. I have one shape that I definitely, I just remind you quickly. So, X has something called a structure shape, and it is defined by its sections on U, if U is say A, is A, which is a ring. Okay, so this is the ring, and I'm interested in modules over that. And so a sheaf of OX modules is quasi coherent if for every open outline, if I let M be the global sections of the sheaf on U, which is an AN module, this is an A, sorry, an A module, then the restriction of F to U is some funny shape called M tilde. Okay. And so basically, there's a process by which, if you give me an a M module, I can construct a shape. And I call this A M tilde, and it's, it's um, determined by. Just the rule that the global sections on, if I have one of these U sub Fs of M tilde, I just make a tensor. Okay, so on U sub F, I want an A sub F module. Okay, and I just do it in the simplest way. Okay, so this itself seems quite complicated, maybe, but the but well, there's some general nonsense which you can use to say that to check this condition, you don't need to check it for every open set. You just need to check it on affine open affine cover. And this, the the thing is that um, this assignment of M to M tilde is functorial, okay, and it's a equivalence or quasi equivalence of categories. If you if you think of M as from the category of A modules and M tilde from the category of Quasi coherent sheaves, you just kind of define a category to make what I just said true. Um, and so, if you're so, the idea is that while sheaves are hard, quasi coherent sheaves to describe them, all you have to do is you have to, need to give an open cover, and on the, each element of the open cover, you need to give a module M. Okay, so just say. You have a finite number of M's, and then there's some compatibility relations between the M's. But that's it. It's just a finite amount of data. And you can translate problems like maps of sheaves and stuff. You can translate them, and they're just maps of modules. Okay, so you're kind of dealing with, instead of dealing with sheaves, you're, just com you're dealing with a, se a set of compatible modules, like right? modules assigned one module for each piece of the open cover plus some compatibility relations. Okay, so you make the problem finite. Maybe a, a very important thing here is that the x of variety, if x is at one, then the category of class of energy is literally is the category of models. So if you just have an affine variety, you just have models. For instance, on A1, A2, or like things we're dealing so far have all been absolute. 
really on this one. Can you repeat what AF is supposed to be resolved? Oh, so AF is uh, so AF is what you get. Sorry, you take the ring and you you pretend that F is invertible. You invert F. Right. So okay. So um, and so the exercise is to uh, show the OX. Yeah. You have there's a shape of shapey endomorphisms which are k-linear from OX to itself. So the first part of the exercise is make sense of what the hell this means. OX is a subshape of this, and then show that. Well, okay, this is going to be the punchline. The point is if you're doing Normally in algebraic geometry, this is the point when I say, okay, forget about all this sheaf stuff. We don't need to know it. We just need to know a little bit about modules. We're going to translate everything into the modules. So forget what I just said. It doesn't matter. Everything, everything inside is quasi coherent. Uh, so the first exercise is, so this sheaf is going to be important to us. Uh, the first exercise is to show that uh, this sheaf is not quasi coherent. Or, that x equals a1. Okay, so unfortunately, in this D-modules course, we can't quite ignore everything that's not quasi cohedrant and turn everything into modules because we have to deal with this nasty guy here, but we'll find out that things are about as close to everything being quasi coherent as you can, as you can hope for, given that fact. Okay, so now we're gonna, that was kind of a review of stuff we're gonna need to know about our great film tree. Now I wanna get really concrete. So the first example is X is affine space. Okay. Um, and this is spec of A where A is a polynomial ring and enter areas. And so here, quasi coherent. Chiefs, just as Chris said, you can just think of them as A modules. Okay. And so, oh. the next example is P1. So, this is the example we want to be able to do in detail. So, it's this has an open cover U union B. So my U is going to be P1 minus infinity, which is an affine line. So we're in this space. So this will be like spec AX. And my V is going to be P1 minus zero. Okay, and so what what what's a quasi coherent shape on P one? So um, so here's my U, and here's my B. Okay, so on U, I have my my ring. My ring A is going to be. Uh, and X, and then this guy in the middle, you intersect the Okay, this is actually just two points, point and point, so it's maybe not an accurate diagram. But this is one of my open covers where I just take everything that's where X is not equal to zero. So here is, so on this guy, the if I'm just thinking of you, I have spec of this and on this part, I have said that this. But on V, I'm, V is also copied by one, so I have the same thing. So I have my V is spec of, uh, spec of this. And from the perspective of this guy, I have um, this guy here. Uh, 
Okay. So both of these guys are isomorphic. So one of them is like sections of um well okay. Both of these guys are just I think of as sections of you intersecting of the structure shape. Okay. But I've choose chosen different coordinates. Okay. But this guy's isomorphic to this, which is isomorphic to this. So the other data I have is that there's an isomorphism, a ring isomorphism from here to here, which says the case of the inverse. Okay. So those are all my rings. And to give a quasi coherent shape, I need to give you modules. Okay. So that means that I need to give you, so I need M to be a KX module. I need N to be, on this side, I need N, which is the KW module. All right. And then when I localize, so let me call this, just to say, notation, let me call this M sub F to be localizing a module in F. So that's the definition of it. When I localize my module here, so here I'm going to localize an X. Okay. That describes M tilde. That describes this M tilde on this guy. Okay. And when I localize N, this describes N, N tilde on the open set and on this set. So N. But now I localize a W. Okay. And these two things better be the same. They're both equal to the sections of my quasi coherent sheet on the same set. So I need to, so giving a quasi coherent sheet means giving one module here, one module here, and a map by sub m sub n here, so that this map is an isomorphism and it's compatible with the map by. Okay, so, uh, so I need, like, very, very concretely, I need. Um, if I apply um, A sub M, where A is in, this guy's in my A sub M, A sub X, sorry, this is small, and this is in my M sub X, I need this to be phi of A times phi of A. So I need it to be compatible with the rings that I just gave, okay? So it's not actually much you need to specify. Two things and a map between them, okay? So like the example that came up last week, you know, the most common example is continuing with x equals p1 is you let f be what's called O of n, okay? And what's O of n mean? I've got to choose an m and n so I choose M to be the simplest or one of the simplest things possible, just my K of X, my M to be K of W, and my phi, I need a map between these two guys when once they're localized. So I let this to be, so if I let it to be phi, that's a valid map. That gives me the structure sheet, okay? Uh, but I can compose that with multiplication by something so that it's invertible w to the n okay, on here. So apply phi and then I also multiply by n. Okay, and that's what this whole of n made. Okay, so now what what is our goal today? So we want to go a step further. So we want to define uh, this sheet of differential operators and we want to make sense of what are left what a left module with respect to those operators are. So our goal, the goal today is we're going to have X, which is going to be smooth. And we want to define the question in the chat. Can you put your OAN? Oh, so repeat what OAN is. Okay. So ON is a quasi-cohonic. Quasi coherent sheet from P1. 
So what is a quasi-coherent chief mean? Well, what's the data? Okay. I need to tell you a K of X module M. Once I have that, then by this formal business, I have a sheep. M can construct me a sheep on you. And if I tell you uh, uh, a KW module by this formal business, I can construct a sheep on V. Okay, and then I just sort of need to make sure that I constructed the same thing on the intersection. Okay, so the other data I need is I need a map from my module MX, once I, here I localize an X to N, N localize at W, I need a map and I need it to respect this map of rings that sends X to W inverse, okay? And so one, the structure sheet you get, one map which definitely respects this map is just the map itself, okay? But once I've mapped from, so my map, this is a map from K, X, X inverse. So in other words, I go from here to here, and then I just post compose with multiplication by N by W squared. And that gives me a valid map, and that you can check that post multiplying isn't going to affect the compatibility. And because this is because multiplying by WN is WN is a unit in this ring, this is invertible. So I still got an isomorphism. So the way I'm going to define this is like a totally backwards way from what it should be done. We're just going to try to see what it is for Alpine space then. P1, and then we're going to see what it is locally, and then we're going to wave our hands and say, you know, you can glue everything together. But the right way to do it is to follow Broken Meek's way of doing it, which you follow, which I won't do. Okay, so we want to define D of X. D of X is some sheet, uh, but let me tell you a few properties of it. Um, it's like, it's an extremely canonical and natural sheet. So it's going to satisfy like things like, if I have U contained in, if I have an open subset, then however I define this for U is the same as if I define it on X and then restrict it. Okay, the second property, which is very, very, very important, is that this guy is quasi coherent. Okay, so we're going to be able to describe it on an open patch. That means we're going to be able to do P1, for example, on just these patches, we don't need to worry about infinitely many open things. Okay. And the other thing I want to say is that this guy is, it contains the structure shapes. So, um, but it's contained in our nasty ring. Uh, nasty shape of rings. Okay. So we're, we're thinking of these as K-linear maps. Uh, on our set of functions. Okay, so this guy isn't quasi coherent. This guy is quasi coherent. Uh, so I should have, I guess I should have said that. So, as an example of something quasi coherent. Um, okay, ne never mind. Okay, so this guy is quasi coherent almost by definition. Uh, this guy is going to be very, very nicely behaved. This, this thing is just completely wild, and, but this thing is going to be nicely behaved. Okay. And the most important example is the following. So if you take X to be the affine space, okay, then, oh, then D sub X is going to just be, I take my bilateral. D sub X is going to be the sheep associated to the bilateral. The bilateral is a ring, so I can apply this construction. Okay. And that's why, like in Christian Snell's notes, the first nine lectures are just about the bilateral because you're just studying, you're just studying this example. And the fact that you've got the sheepy construction and stuff is just completely irrelevant in this example. Because this is an affine, this is an affine space, 
and everything is close enough to quasi coherent that you just it's just a problem about modules. But let me just note like one further case just to illustrate a little bit what's going on. So if I take if I have n equals one, then I'm I'm thinking that like I have part, partial derivative with respect to x. I'm thinking of that as a way of a map from polynomials to polynomials. Okay. But part of this statement is saying that, like, well, actually, this is not just an operator from polynomial to polynomial. It's it it gives rise from map of sheaves to sheaves. Okay. So I have my open sets. So what what this means is that. What this is saying concretely is that I expect my differential operator to really be a map from, if I invert some function f, I expect to be able to extend the map to a map like this. So here f is in c sub x. Okay. And this is true because basically by the chain rule. So like how would you define how would you define dx of f inverse? So you would say, okay, imagine things are well-defined. I know that zero is the derivative of one. And if I imagine that f is invertible, I can write it like this, okay? But then I can apply the chain rule and say this is, if I imagine this was already well-defined, I could write it like this. Okay. And so that inspires the definition. You can extend this map by setting d of x inverse to be equal to minus f to dx of f. Okay. So I'm only saying this because I'm going to present things like in the simplest way possible. Okay just trying to deal with maps like this, like one single map. But under the hood, everything's sheepified. And the reason everything works is because either things are quasi-coherent or things obey like a Leibniz rule and you can do this trick to extend maps when you need to. Okay, so I know that's a little bit vague, but it's just a justification for taking some shortcuts. So one way to see that everything inside is well defined you could imagine all of these like elements of polynomial when you can when you were joining denominators and stuff and so all of that's moving in the fraction here and the differential operators are well defined in the fraction here. So you see immediately that they are you know, defined on everything and they're compatible in the ways you want. Okay. So this is I think like one of the things we want to get out of this talk is like what happens for P1. Okay, I haven't defined this, but I've told you what it is in this case. So we can kind of work out what happens to P1. So I'm going to use the same notation. I have my U, I have my V. Okay. And I've told you that this is a quasi-coherent sheet. Okay. So I need to tell you um, K of X module over here. Okay. And I've told you exactly what that K of X module has to be. Okay. So on this side, on U, I have my M. Is going to be a one. So just to write it out explicitly, like a, well, here I just have one relation. Dx x equals one. Okay. So my okay. So m is an a module. Okay, it's also a shape of rings. I should say this is a shape of rings. And that's well, that's part of this statement that it embeds in here. This is a shape of rings. Okay, and it's quasi coherent, which means that on this patch here where I invert x, so here my ring becomes a localized to x. So, uh, of this is my use of x. That's this guy here. 
uh, then I need to localize I localize at x and I get k x x inverse. So this is part of the problem. I'm using cross coherence here to justify doing it. So, okay. Okay. so then that's what my ring, that's what my module looks like. That's my m sub x here. Okay. And so as this computation showed, uh, this I can think of this as embedded in endomorphisms of a x x So I'm thinking of my particle differential operator as acting on it, acting on the underlying ring. Okay. So that is my that sort of like describes what this dx is on U. And now to the power of P1, I just do the exact same thing for V and I just need to make sure that things are compatible in the intersection. So I also let my N be A1. All right, but now I'll pick my coordinates. I'll call my coordinate W. And then this localizes, I have a map from here to N sub W, okay, where I just replace W with W inverse. I may as well just write it down once. This embeds in. Um, and I want a map between, I want an isomorphism between them. In this case, it's going to be an isomorphism of rings. Instead of calling it phi mn, because I'm going to use it again, I'll call it uh, phi tilde. And I want this to be compatible with the structure. Uh, I want this to be compatible with this map of rings, this phi. So what this compatibility means is if you give me an endomorphism of this guy, I can get an endomorphism of this guy. So let me just remind, just write it out again. So I have this mean isomorphism that I need things to be compatible with. X goes to W inverse. Okay. If you give me a guy over here, I can give you so this is a, I can give you an endomorphism over here. How do I do it? I take um I take this guy, use this map to translate in terms of the x's, then I apply u, and then I translate that sorry, by inverse more. No. So the compatibility condition with the rings is saying that this map, this has to commute. Okay, so if I think of a partial differential, if I think of dx as acting here, as acting here, if I translate it into a map on these guys, it's going to have to be, that's going to be have to be the endomorphism of what I sent it to here. Okay. The exercise is to show why tilde is well defined. And, well, it takes dx to minus w squared dw. So you can, which is what you kind of get from applying the chain rule of the sequence. I was define one more thing and then we'll have a break. So the definition, so a left the sub x module and is a look at a D module a D module M is a shape of uh, so this could be left or right 
baby module. So the definition is that it's just a shape of left or right day sub x modules. And because of this fact that I presented that D of X contains the structure shape, anything that is a day module is automatically an OX module. So it makes sense to talk about whether it's quasi coherent or not. So another definition is that uh, M is quasi coherent if like as a DX module, if it is quasi coherent as an OX module. Uh, and sort of to bring it back to where where we started, if I take x to be am, then in this case my um d sub x was these guys from the file algebra and a quasi coherent a quasi coherent left. D module, the X module is exactly M tilde. These guys are things of the form L M tilde where M is a left A M module. Yeah. Yeah. So this has been a very confusing way of getting back to where we started. We started with Actually, at the start, I wanted to show finitely generated. We started with finitely generated left modules over the um, uh, the bile algebra, and we saw that they corresponded to systems of different equations. And these, exactly by this cheapifying construction, can be viewed as quasi coherent d of x module, left d of x modules. Okay, and then the goal is to sort of see how this works globally. If we say if we let x to be p1, so let me just end by saying I'll just end the first talk. So if we let x to be p1, right? Um, so I have my u, I have my v. Okay, and I had my description of dx, which was, I had a copy of a1 here, I had a copy of a1 here, this one had coordinates x, this one had coordinates w, and I had this isomorphism of rings, so when I took one a1 and I localized at x, it was isomorphic to the other a1, localized at w, okay. And so a D module, what's the data? A quasi-coherent, so a quasi-coherent D of X module. What is the data? So this is very similar to what I said before about quasi-coherent shape, but it's worth just repeating. Uh, so I need to specify a left A1 module. M, okay, because that's for this one, which is just affine space. And affine space, we're just talking about A1 modules. Okay, and I need a left A1 module M. Okay, and I need to give you an isomorphism. So I have the structure on U, I have the structure on V, I need to show they agree. I need an isomorphism from M localized X to N localized X, and I need uh, W. And I need this to be compatible with my map by tilde that I have here between the A1s. Oh, here, sorry, I just wrote it here. Okay, so I need compatibility, so I need
graph so for a and r a1 So anyway, so the conclusion is um, while this is very complicated, if we're just looking at P1, it's a very finite set of the data you need to provide two A1 modules and an isomorphism between them. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll take a break. I've got more exercises, I'll write them on the board. And so sorry for making it very technical, but I hope at least you have the tools that if you go back and look on the notes online, have a lot more details. If you go and look at it slowly, you will be able to compute sort of any example you need to compute. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, just something that came up in the chat. So I just wanted to be clear I did not define what D of X is yet. I told you a couple of properties, to, like it's, you know, for example, it's quasi coherent, and I did tell you what it is for Alpine space, and I did tell you what it is for. P1, okay? But the goal of the second half of the talk is to give a definition which works for anything, okay? And the difficulty here is that if we were in like manifold land or, you know, we're doing complex geometry, we could make some argument like around every point in our manifold, we take an open subset which locally looks like an open subset of affine space, and we kind of try to, we know what happens to affine space, and we kind of try to port the answer over. The problem is when you're doing algebraic geometry, you're working with the Zariski topology, where open sets is basically an open set is dense. It's just like almost the whole set. Okay, so our open sets are too big. So any variety that's not like birational to Alpine space, there just aren't going to be open sets which are isomorphic to open subsets of Alpine space. Okay, so we can't just we can't we're not quite ready yet to bootstrap. We're doing this completely wrong approach to defining these things, where we like to define things for affine space and then bootstrap and define them for everything else locally. And we, we can't quite do that yet, okay? But but the moral of the story is that we, we can actually do it. Just I just need to define like a little bit more first, okay? So first I need to, so this is also something very useful. Uh, so this is like a review. So here again, x is going to be smooth variety over k. And I want to define, I want to remind you of two very important sheets that we have. So we have um, the tangent sheet. So I'm going to define this and the cotangent sheet. Okay. Oh, what, what am I doing? Okay. And these are both classic for hearing changes. Okay. And they're very important and very economical. And if you, like, for example, if you're used to like complex geometry, you should think of this as the, this is the shape of sections of tangent vectors or vector fields, if that makes sense to you. And then this would be a shape of like holomorphic one forms. Oh, sorry. Sheaf of holomorphic vector fields or the sheaf of holomorphic one forms. Okay. And if you're not, just I'm just going to give you the definition, so don't worry about it. Okay. So I'm in the interest of time, I have to throw some stuff under the carpet. So I'm going to tell you what these guys are on an affine open. So I have an affine open. So here my A is going to be a finitely generated. K algebra. Okay. And then I define a module as follows. So omega sub A. So this is A. This is different. X is a set, is a variety, and A is a ring. Okay. So this is the uh, free A module. Importantly, I should say here, A is commutative. Okay, so I'm being a bit loose with left and right when I talk about modules, it's because we're in the community world. So this is commutative, generated by some formal symbols, V sub A, 
And so data A is just a formal symbol. That's right? just a variable uh, with uh, relations. Uh, so I have three relations I imposed. Uh, D of A plus A prime is D of A plus D of A prime. B, if I A times A prime, I have the Leibniz rule. So this is A D A prime plus A prime D A. And C is uh, D lambda equals zero if lambda is in K. So it kills scalars, otherwise it behaves like the Leibniz rule. <laughs> okay. And the key is kind of fast. In terms of computing these things, is that if A is generated by, if A is generated uh, as a K algebra by some generators, A1 through AR, subject to relations uh, R1 equals RT to zero. If I have generators and relations, then Omega A is generated by uh, DA1 of the DAR subject to relations DR1 equals CRT to zero. And so my easy sort of example is. X is affine space, and in that case, my A is a polynomial ring. So that one is has generated X1 through Xn, and there's no relations. Okay, so in this case, this guy is just A the X1 plus, it's so just a free A one of these generators. And But we're not, we, we need sort of harder example to justify this additional abstraction. So we're not just wasting our time because we kind of already understand our own space. Okay. So the motive, yeah, the, the motivation here is anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll just keep going. Um, <laughs> right, the thing we're trying to do is we solve things for the affine space. We just need to know about what the bio algebra is. And the way it's going to work in general is we just need, all we need is a more intrinsic definition of the vial algebra, which works slightly more generally, and then we're going to be done. Okay, so we're just going to a little bit of effort to explain the intrinsic notion of what the vial algebra is. Um, so, so um, here's something that's not birational to our space, but it's smooth, a smooth curve. Okay, if I take um, an elliptic curve, but just on A2, then this looks something like this. There's one, zero, minus one. Okay, so this is the guy where I can't cover with open sets, which are isomorphic to open sets of affine space. Okay, and it has generators X and Y, so I can just right now so this is my a oh sorry that was a the so x is my x is step a so omega a is um a dx plus a dy and then i need to quotient by my relations which i just apply b to this guy and you can check that you get two y dy is equal to uh, three, sorry. Three x squared minus one dx. So here we have, um, we need two generators, but the trick, see, the, the trick here is if I let, um, I let this, if I let F to be, say, Y, and I look at U sub F, 
which is spec. So I, if I invert y, so this is my set where y is not equal to zero. So the sets where the points where y is equal to zero are the solutions to this equation. So I've got three points here. If I take the Zariski open set with everything but these three points, then omega from A sub F, which by the way is the same, these things are extremely canonical. It's the same thing as if I do this, uh, it's just going to be A sub F times dx, because once I invert y, I can express dy as 3x squared minus 1 and 2y equals. So now it's a free module, there's no relations. Okay, and the idea here is that I have my big set u sub f, and x, x gives me a map from u sub f to a1. Okay, so I take, like I think of projecting everything down onto the x axis. Okay. And that, in this case, it's a nice two to one covering map. Okay, so this map is, it's not an embedding of U.S. sub F into Antoine's mess, but it's sort of the closest thing. So it's what's called a tile. And that's the best you can do. It, depending on your background, you can think of this as like a local, as a covering space. Okay. All right, so, um, I think. Yeah. Okay. So now I can define the type of shape. So if I did one more thing here, so we're going to be very interested in the dual. We're going to be very interested in the dual of this. It's like, okay, so um, if I have a map, oh, sorry. I forgot one thing. This, this, there's a natural map for D from A to omega A, which you can check as a K little map and the same A to the A. Oh, I should have written that down here. Sorry. I just think I need that notation. Okay, so given about if I take something in the dual space, say pi, then I can pre compose it with this D map. So I get a map from And the image of this map, so th this is this is a k-linear. If I compose this, this is just a k-linear endomorphism. It's no longer a-linear. The image of this map, all the guys, this is maybe not the, this is like just meant to be a quick way of defining things. The image of this guy is called um, the derivations of a and q. So the derivations are all the guys that you take one of these and you can pre compose it with D. Or the better way of saying it is that um, an endomorph a K linear endomorphism in here. Oh, so the D is a map from A to A, which is. And an element of this space, which is called a derivation, is a K linear map that satisfies the Leibniz. So, so 
this is kind of, I'm saying this is an isomorphism by definition. Okay, but there's a few like details to, to sort out here. Basically, there's three sort of ways of defining defining things, and I'm sort of giving you one of them. Um, um, yeah. The conclusion is that this tangent sheet, oh, sorry, this co, the cotangent sheet is defined by its sections on U. This my omega a, and the tangent sheet is the joint. And the point of this last thing is, I sometimes want to complete. I will sometimes want to precompose with this map D to think of these as maps from. Instead of maps from here to here, I'm thinking continuous maps from A to A, which sat which are K-linear and satisfy the Leibniz rule. Okay. And I'm just telling you that you can go back and forth between these two perspectives. Okay. So now we have that. We can say. Well, But now we can give the definition, which is the analog of a local chart. Okay, but in with an algebraic geometry. So again, the same setup we have here, and we say that if you could give me elements x1 through xr and a is a, a local coordinates. Oh, sorry. I want to say here that X is smooth of dimension equal to N. Uh, let's say that's N. So if I have something smooth, I can talk about local coordinates. Okay, these guys are local coordinates if well, so this is a nice small piece of Okay, the local coordinates are just functions I keep so that the D of those that form a variable um, makes this a free makes this a, a free A module for dimension N. And then it's just a fact that the smooth varieties, smooth varieties are covered by these charts. Okay. Right. And it's it's really just what like this is the model you think of that you know you have this elliptic curve uh, and you have this patch where you have a y and a y x is a local coordinate okay if this one got it's x and that gives it doesn't give me an embedding in our front space but it gives me an atom map okay and you if you want as an exercise you can say like what's the other patch what's the other patch where y is the local variable uh, the local coordinate. Okay, and then once we have that, we can talk about dual coordinates. So this is, so before we talk about partial derivatives, because we kind of know how to differentiate, it, talk about the partial derivative of a polynomial. But now we're going to give a more intuitive definition. And we say that we let, given both the coordinates, we let dx1 Really, x n in form In other words, if I'm taking from as much from here to here, I'm thinking that they take like a dxj and they spit out one if i is equal to j and zero otherwise. Okay, so once it's a free module, it makes sense to talk about a dual basis. But I can also, 
And I also want to think, like sometimes I want to think about these as, I want to pre-compose with D and think of these as maps from A to A, okay? And with this way of thinking about it, like this statement corresponds to saying that the XI of, it takes, this as a function and spits out the IJ, okay? Or in other words, if I take, Another way of saying things is if I take any element in here in A, the dxi applied to f is the sum. Oh, sorry. Well, D of f is the sum i equals one to n of d sub xi applied to f dxi. Right. If you have never seen it before, just think through. You got to think through the definitions. Unfortunately, like this complete abuse of notation, where I sometimes think of things here and I sometimes think of things here, just leads to a little bit of sorting out. Like when you're thinking about one way versus the other, it makes it sort of artificially a little bit more confusing than it has to be. But now we sort of have an intrinsic definition of of what the partial differential operator actually is. Okay, and then uh, so the exercise to show the following. So, firstly, with this setup, show that um, here I'm thinking of things as derivations maps from A to A. So, we can talk about of the bracket, we can do differentiate with respect to x and then y minus doing it in the reverse order. Okay, and that is going to be well, it's a, part of the exercises to show that that is actually a derivation. Uh, but I want you to show something stronger that it's zero. So just like normal partial derivatives commute with each other, they do so here. And the second thing to show. And this one is easy. Oh, well, sorry. This statement is equivalent to the Leibniz rule. If you, it's like a one line proof, but it's it's worth doing. Is that if I take f in a, and I consider a, um, I can consider a inside endomorphisms of a acting by, uh by acting by left, uh, by acting by multiplication. So, okay. so an element here, I can think of as an endomorphism. I can, <clears throat> working in here, I can make sense of this Lie bracket, of this bracket, and you've got to show that that is the same as dx of f, okay. Um, so in for the case of the bioalgebra, f here was x sub j, and then this was delta ij. Okay. So we have a definition. So with this set up, so I have x1, xn, and a local coordinates. <coughs> I let D sub A be the A sub algebra of M A of A generated by of D sub X R. So I, I, I just take these operators that I've been given and I just look inside here, this is an algebra, K algebra, and I just take everything that they generate. So this is just like in the Vila algebra where I want to take uh, derivatives of derivatives of derivatives. I just finished by them. Yeah. 
And then the fact is that the relations, um, so it's generated by these guys, as I said, but the relations are precisely A and B. So this is, and the example we keep coming back to is when X is affluent space, this goes back to like the first line of the talk. This is like exactly what we were saying about bilateral theory. Okay. So, so in this case, DNA is the bilateral. Okay. So in this case, A is polynomials. The polynomial ring, and we want the subalgebra generated by these operators so that things commute, and we have this relation. And the thing to note here is that we only need to check this, only need to check on generators of A as a chaotic ring. Okay. So these were our generators. Okay, that gives us a presentation of the bilateral. And the conclusion here is that this D of A is really very, very close to the bilateral. Okay. The coefficients we have are in A, which isn't quite a polynomial ring. Okay. So that's one difference. But we still have this notion of a partial differential differential operators and they commute and they satisfy almost the same condition as for the bilateral. Right. And then finally, the definition in quotes of oh. okay. So if we have X the smooth variety. And we have U and K containing X, and we have X1 up to Xn in A local coordinates. Then my D, my differential operators on U as a sheaf on U is equal to this D of A tilde. Which is a shape, a quasi coherent shape on U. And then I do a long squiggly line and say, like, drum roll, uh, I don't know, like abracadabra, absolute magic. Yeah, I can glue this together. Glue, blah, blah, blah. And then I get a shape. B sub X, okay. So this is the point where doing everything completely the wrong way means that I can't really um, say much more than waving my hands here. Okay, but what I've described to you is what the shape of differential operators looks like locally, and that's extremely useful for computations and it's extremely useful for proving things. Okay, when you're doing things with operations with shapes, you often just reduce it to a local texture and store some what's happening on the right patch. Okay, so for most things, we just we really just need to know the local situation. Okay, uh, let me just comment that another way of defining them. So, um, not, not all spec A will admit local coordinates, right? No, but if X is, yeah, so the thing that I just said in words was if X is a smooth variety, it admits the cover mm -hmm. by, yeah, by yeah. things with both coordinates. And then you can, I guess, check that it doesn't have local coordinates. Sorry? Like you can check that this thing that you get is independent of the choice of local coordinates if they exist. Exactly. So that's why this approach is an absolutely terrible approach because you've just given yourself a huge amount of 
difficult work. Whereas if you do things in a very unique style, all these problems evaporate. They don't just never come up. Um, so one, one definition, I'll give you one of my proper definition. This is not the growth in a definition, but the B of X is the smallest um, subring of this non quasi coherent ring generated by post of X and derivations. Okay. Where this guy just means the tangent sheet. This just was the tangent sheet that I defined, except that instead of viewing things, the tangent sheet can be viewed as the jewel of the cotangent sheet. Okay. Or I can view it by composing with D as derivations. So this is just to, to specify which way I'm thinking of it. Generated by this and this. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and then there's a growth rate definition which we might get to in future lectures, but I'm not even going to say what it is now. Um, but I I don't know how much time I have, but I just say one more thing, maybe, is that like, what is the, like the key tool or a key tool to study these things? Is we have this relation B, okay, and this is what this is what's stopping our ring being our uh, commutative, right? So these things commute A is a commutative ring, okay, but we have this non-commutative part, okay, and um. Unless your name is Daniel, you don't actually know anything about non-commutative rings. Okay, so you don't know what to do. But people, some people who are not named Daniel know things about commutative rings about ray geometry. Okay. So one of the key things we want to do is we want to deform our D of X by um so that this B goes to B prime where B prime is the relation where this is zero. And then everything commutes, okay? And then you're a commutative algebra line. And then my D sub A is very simple. It's just, I started with A and I adjoined uh, N commuting operators. So I get like just a polynomial ring. Okay. And these polynomial, these partial differential operators, I'm thinking, I can think like globally, you know, that these are sections of the tangent sheet. All right. And this is extremely confusing, but um, a section of a tangent sheet means a map from the base up to the tangent sheet. I can think of it that way, or I can think of it as a function on the cotangent bundle. So I can think of a section as a map into the tangent space or a map away from the cotangent space. So these are actually, this polynomial ring is actually the functions on the cotangent space of X. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that um, um, okay. Okay, X has a cotangent space, and she's uh, sections of that was my omega, but functions on functions on this guy are exactly this guy uh, lo locally. So we're deforming. We deform d sub x to functions on here. Okay, and the fancy way of saying that is uh, the push forward of the structure sheet for the event. Okay. Uh, and now you're in the, the benefit of doing this is now you're in commutative algebra land and outer rate geometry. Okay. All right, so that's that's all.